last night I started talking about the theme we have, uh, which is God, the Lord, our reward. And so I'm going to pick up a little bit from there, and we will track the story of Abraham a little bit more uh, today. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I'm very concerned about and have been for some time, but it's getting uh, more heightened for me as a concern, is that a lot of Christians do not understand the fundamentals of their faith. Uh, Christians are just happy to go to church and to be blessed and, and to hear the word of God, but they don't understand the fundamentals of their faith. And, and because very little of Christian doctrine is being taught these days. And uh, this year, uh, I spent our theme in our church is God. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time uh, teaching on God, who he is, his character, his nature, and all of that. Last year, uh, in I think it was in the month of, uh, of November, we started a new kind of conference in our ministry in our church. <clears throat> Pardon me. We call it the God Summit. And uh, it's something I've been praying for and, and working towards uh, because people are asking a lot of questions and many times the church is not able to answer the questions. Uh, questions about who is God? Where did God come from? Who created God? Um, and all the ideas people have uh, about science and God and evolution and all of that. And sometimes we make passing comments on them uh, in, in the church, but we don't really take time uh, to address some of those questions. So uh, last year I did a lot of that, uh, answering some of the very critical questions that Christians are asking, especially young people who are confused by all the ideas uh, that they are hearing. And uh, I believe that it's time for the church to, to focus on answering the vital questions that people are asking about God, about Jesus Christ, about their faith, about the authenticity of the Bible, um, the reliability of the Bible. Can the Bible be trusted? Is it accurate? Uh, these are very important things. Uh, how many books of the Bible are, are there? Are there other books of the Bible? Uh, what do you do about all these concepts about... <clears throat> Uh, pardon me, I think I need to drink water. About an apocrypha uh, and all of that. And, and you know, sometimes it, you can just say, oh, it doesn't matter, but it matters. Because when people don't have questions answered in the church, they go out to look for answers. And these days, so many things are being said out there on social media. And Christians are getting confused by the day. And, I, and so... I have become quite concerned, uh, and I try not to be too, um, should I say, exciting when I'm preaching these days. I just want to be informative. I want people to be informed, to understand, to have clarity, to have the scriptures made clear to God's people. Amen? Amen. And I hope that what we share today will help you in your discovery of who God is and how we relate to him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, addresses our theme in a different way, but it deals with the same concept. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who, or she who, both he and she, he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It's a very interesting construction of sentence. He who comes to God must believe that he 
is, not he was or he shall be, but that he is. God is ever present. And, and that phrase or that statement about God shows us one of the important or essentials of the nature of God, that God is. And we say that God is eternal. He is an eternal God. He is an uncreated God. God has no source, has no beginning. He creates the beginning, but he has no beginning. Because if he has a beginning, he must of necessity have an end. Everything that has a beginning is time bound to have an end. God has no beginning and so he has no end. God has no past. He has no future. He is always God. Of course, when we human beings talk about God, because we are not eternal, we say that he was, is, and is to come. Because we are trying to express God from a human point of view. But the reality is God has no past. He has no present. He has no future. Because if he has a past, then it means that there is a period that he is not in. Because that period has passed. But God is always present. He is a very present help in time of need. There is no moment when God is not. He is at all times. God is. He is the eternal God. And, and so the Bible says if we want God to be the rewarder of our faith, we have to know who he is. That, that means until you catch the full extent of God's nature as eternal, it is difficult for you to believe him for him to reward you. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. Now the challenge with God being eternal is us because we are not eternal. We are time bound. We have a beginning. We have an end. God has no beginning. He has no end. So how does an eternal God deal with temporary people? Because God cannot deal with us eternally. Because we are not eternal. There was a moment we were not and then there is a moment we are, and there is another moment we are not. But God is. There is no moment when he is not. So how does the eternal God deal with us who are not eternal? Because all of that has to do with how we receive from God. He works things from eternity. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15 says, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of, of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. But the point I want to emphasize is the first phrase. Thus says the high and lofty one who dwells or who inhabits eternity. Now, the, the, the phrase means that not only is God eternal, he lives in eternity. Now, you and I don't live in eternity. We can tell time. Today is Wednesday, the 5th of June, 2024. And tomorrow would not be Wednesday, the 5th of June, 2024. Tomorrow will be another time. And every hour will be another time. And every minute will be another time. 
but God dwells in eternity. So if I have a need now, if I have a need now and I pray to God who lives in eternity, how is he going to answer my prayer? Because with him, there is no time. With me, there is time. I need it right now. So you say, Lord, I need you to, 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 to help me sort out this problem I have. And this problem is time bound. But God is not time bound. So how does he make sense of me who is asking him to do something in time when he's eternal? Because if he just dwells in eternity, then a day with the Lord is like a thousand. Yes, so, so God will say, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow and that's the next 1,000 years. By the time it is done, you're gone. So, so God, God who is eternal has to be able to work with us within our time. Although he's not time bound, he has to work with time. So God is both eternal, but he works with time. So I want you to have that concept at the back of your mind. And we go back to the book of Genesis chapter 8 as we track Abraham. Chapter 18, sorry. Genesis chapter 18. And uh, verse 13 and 14. Genesis 8, 18, 13 and 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely, shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. And I'm going to raise a people out of you. You're going to be the father of nations. But I'm going to give you a special son. And through that one son... I'm going to work out my purposes. So this son is going to be a child of promise. Abraham believed that. And we read that yesterday. Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. But if you read right after that. Abraham did something that makes you wonder. Did he really believe God? Because his wife said to Mr. Abraham, Sir, I think I have a good plan for you. I think we can work this out. I'm going to give you my maid. And you're going to have a child with her. Now, when you re look on the surface, it, it, it's, it's almost as if Abraham stopped believing God. But the Bible says Abraham did not stagger at the promise of God. So, was that staggering? Was he faithless? Did he lose faith? No. Abraham believed the promise was to him. Not to him and Sarah. So, Abraham's mind and the mind of Sarah, Sarah is thinking, you are the one God spoke to. You're the one who's supposed to be the father of many nations. God never spoke anything to me. So, I don't want to be a hindrance to you not becoming what God wants you to be. So I'm going to step out of the way so that you can become. 
So Abraham says, I think it's a good plan. <laughs> so they did the arrangement. And Hagar conceived. And uh, boy, child. So Abraham came to God and said, sir, finally it happened. The promise you gave me has happened. I have a son. And God says, oh, Mr. Abraham, I didn't tell you the first time. But actually, I meant when I said you, I meant your wife, Sarah. So work done zero anyway. So now Abraham has to go back to the drawing board. And, and believe that this woman, whom the scripture testifies as more than dead, is for some reason going to provide a child for him to fulfill the mandate of God. So now in chapter 18, the Lord appears to Abraham on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Lord says to Abraham, and at this time, Sarah is in the tent and Abraham and the angel of the Lord and the Lord himself are talking. And God says to Abraham, Sarah shall have a child. And Sarah heard it. This is the first time that Sarah has heard that the promise was not only to Abraham but to her. And faith comes by hearing. So later when you read the book of Hebrews, it says, And Sarah herself received strength to conceive. Why did it say Sarah herself? Because her Sarah thought this is Abraham's promise. But now she heard directly from God and she realized this is my promise too. And when she heard the word of God, she now had faith. So it's not just husband having faith, it's wife also having faith. That is a dynamism that we need in our marriages. God doesn't just use the husband, he also uses the wife. Both must hear from God. So Sarah hears from God. But then her response is quite Interesting. She laughs. And so she's in the tent. She hears you. Uh, Abraham, your wife Sarah is going to have a child. And she laughs in the tent. So the angel says, why did Sarah laugh? Sarah says, I didn't laugh. The angel says, you laughed. Now, if Sarah was laughing at the promise of God, then she was not exhibiting faith. So she couldn't then uh, activate faith for the miracle to happen. Because if God gives you a promise and you laugh at the promise of God, you are not exhibiting faith. So what was Sarah laughing at? Was she laughing at the promise of God? No, she was laughing at the process. She's not laughing at the promise. She's laughing at the process. Because if you read the text, she says, how can this be? Me being old. The old boy being old. How does this happen? In other words, I understand how babies are formed. Not between me and him. It's not been happening for a very long time. So whatever produces babies, he says, am I going to go through this process again? So she's not laughing at the promise of God. She's just laughing at the ridiculousness of what she has to do for the promise to become a reality. So although she laughs, 
It does not nullify her faith because she's laughing at human laughter based on what she has to do for the promise to become a reality. But she believed God too. She believed God. But that's not what I'm talking about. I just want to, you to take note of what the Lord says to Sarah. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh saying, shall I bear a child since I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. There are three time references in that statement because God is eternal, but the miracle must happen in time. God is eternal, but my miracle must happen in time. I don't have eternity for God to work a miracle for me. You don't have eternity too. Some of you need a miracle right now. Some of you need it tomorrow. Some need it next week by this time. Some need it by the 30th of June. Some need it by 31st December. But all of that is time. It's not eternity. So God is saying to Abraham, I am eternal, but I understand your time because I am the creator of time. I created time. That's one reason why God cannot live in time because he created time. He had to exist before time so he cannot be bound by the thing he has created and be contained by it. That is why none, no place in the universe can contain God because he existed before the universe. So there is no place in the entirety of the universe you will travel and find God because he brought it into being and he cannot be captured by the thing he brought into being. He exists outside of eternity and the created order. Yet he operates within it time and the created order because he is responsible for the things he has created. So he says to Abraham, I'm going to deal with it. So three time sequences. The first one is what he described as appointed time. He says, at the appointed time, I will return to you. Everybody say appointed time. When God speaks to you and he speaks to me, and he wants to do something great in your life, there is an appointed time for that. An appointed time indicates a time or a place of meeting. The Hebrew word used there, moed, means a place of meeting. It's actually used sometimes to describe the tabernacle of meeting when they gather. So God is saying, there is going to be a meeting point between you and my word. My word is eternal, but it's going to meet you somewhere and your time is going to synchronize with my word. It's called the appointed time. Somebody say, there is an appointed time for me. Now the appointed time, nobody knows it. It's a divine season fixed by God. It's a divine season. It is fixed by God. God fixed the time for the coming of Christ. He fixed the time when he will become flesh. So in the fullness of time, an angel had to go to Mary and announce it's time. Because the eternal God works with appointed times. A time or a season when 
he's going to meet you and perform his good word towards you. The appointed time is usually in the future. Nobody knows the appointed time. But there is an appointed time. It's a time of God's appointment. It's a timetable of God. It's a season when God makes things happen in your life. One of the things we have to understand is that we cannot make God do what he doesn't want to do. You can't. You cannot make God do what he doesn't want to do. You can only receive what he wants to do. If God doesn't do it or doesn't want it to happen, you can't make it happen. Because, you know, because sometimes we get the impression that we can make God do what he doesn't want to do. Because one of the qualities of God is that he doesn't change. He's infinite. God does not improve. He does not get better. God doesn't get better. So, so there is nothing like God was very wicked in the Old Testament. Then after killing people, he said, ah, these people, they don't change, so I won't kill them again. So now God has improved in his relation. No, no, no. God knows all things. There is no knowledge outside of him for him to aspire to. Because if there is a knowledge outside of him for him to aspire to, then he's not complete. And if he's not complete, then his imperfection can be manipulated against him. But God is perfect. God is unchangeable. God doesn't change. So when I pray, I am not changing God. All of you who think you are praying to change God, I'm just helping you out. Your prayer doesn't change God. Your fasting doesn't change God. Your giving doesn't change God. Your prayer, your fasting, your worship doesn't change God. Because if you succeed in changing God, then you have power over him. And if you have power over him to make him act against his wishes, then you are God. Because the definition of God is one of whom nothing greater can be imagined. So if there is any entity that can make God act in a way that is not what he wanted to do, that entity now rules over God. So you cannot change him. The reason we pray is not to change God, is to change ourselves. So that we come into alignment with God. God is constant. We are out of the way, and our prayer brings us into the will of God. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, it is fixed. On earth, we pray that we come into alignment into God's fixed agenda. So he says to Abraham, it's fixed. There is an appointed time. And Sarah is going to have a child. 
So that's the first time reference we find in the scripture. The second time reference is a phrase that the passage uses. It calls it the time of life. Some translations in the Bible says next year about this time. Those are paraphrases. The time of life is a natural time. It's a point in time. So, the time of life is the natural time cycle for things to happen. So, for example, let, let me give you this example. If I have a mango tree, you don't have mango trees in America, but I have in Ghana. You wish I would say apple, but I don't have apple trees in my world. So if I have a mango tree in Ghana, West Africa, and I pray, Lord, give me a great harvest of mangoes in this year. And God wants to do that for me. When will the mango tree bear fruit? In the season of mango tree, mangoes. In Ghana, it's around April, May, thereabouts for the first season. And the second season is around November, December, getting to January. So around Easter and Christmas, there is mangoes. That's the season. That's the time of life of the mango. So although God is answering my prayer, he does not violate the time of life because the time of life is a principle he has established for his natural creation to function. So he says to Sarah, there is an appointed time. But that appointed time, when the time comes, there is going to be a time of life. And God is not going to give you a short pregnancy. The time of life for a woman to deliver a child, all things being equal, is nine months. So God is not saying, because it's a miracle, you got pregnant two months, boom, the child is born. So he said, I have a miracle baby. Oh, he was received, conceived, and born in two months. <laughs> That's not how God works. That's why sometimes people give testimonies. I watch them very closely. I say, I hear you. It doesn't work with the time of life. The time of life for a child to be born is nine months. So God is saying to Sarah, although you've waited for this miracle for so long, and God is about to do it for you, he's not going to circumvent the natural process. First, you and Abraham have to cooperate and do your part of this transaction. Because a child is not going to be born just by you eating gari. <laughs> you have to do what has to be done. It is the natural process set in place by God. And he says, when you do your part, I will fulfill my word in your life. And when you become pregnant... God is not going to say, oh, she's waited for so long. Oh, she's tired. Oh, it's been so difficult. I will shorten it for her. She will do it in two months. No. He says, according to the time of life. So that's the second time sequence. The appointed time must work with the time of life. But there is a third time sequence in the passage it is implied 
although it is not specifically spoken about, is the time they are living in. Because the angel is speaking at a time, the time when he's speaking to Abraham and to Sarah. So the time you live in, the appointed time, and the time of life. Every promise of God makes use of these three time references. The time you live in, the appointed time, and the time of life. So, you live now. God has an appointed time for you. And when he visits you at the appointed time, you still have to go through the time of life. Now, one of the challenges we have in trusting God is that many times we feel that our pain and our inconvenience is a justification or is enough reason for us to bypass process. So let's say a lady has waited for so long to marry. And she's praying. And God says, yeah, 2024, I will visit you. And uh, the right man will show up. That's the appointed time, 2024. So let's say the guy shows up. 2024, June. During Dunamis Teaching Conference. So the guy shows up. All right. So the appointed time has come. And then you, you meet the person and you say, oh yeah, this is the person. We're going to get married tomorrow. Now, you've waited for years, but you can marry tomorrow. Because although their appointed time has been met by God, there is a second time process, the time of life that you have to work with. So that what God says to you has fullness of time to mature and to get to the fullness of time. Now, you, it's possible for God's appointed time to be fulfilled in your life and yet miss the time of life. Mary her appointed time when Gabriel showed up. Hey Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst all women. What is this salutation? And blah, 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 blah. Divine appointment. But Jesus was not born the next day. Even he who was not conceived by human agency, but by divine agency. Even he who is God, when God comes into our time to work, he respects the time of life. So, even for him who has no physical father, whose father is the creator, he goes through the time of life. A time of appointment and the time of life. It worked with Abraham and it works with every process of God in our lives. There is an appointed time for God to perfect what he has said in your life. There is an appointed time for the release of what God promised he will release into your life. But the appointed time is not the finality of all that God is doing. 
when the appointed time comes, there has to be a time of life for that process started by God to reach its full extent. And when it reaches full extent, then you can see the complete miracle. Eternity working with time, with appointed time, with time of life, and the time you are in. And that's how God rewards our faith. Now, many Pentecostals, I am one, and Charismatics, I am one. We, our time reference is always instant. It's Pentecostal time reference. Instant. Because we hear it many times from the pulpit. Instant. Everything happens instant. Everything happens instant. So our whole life is, if it is of God, it must be instant. So when God is working through the time of life, sometimes we feel uneasy. It's like you trust God for healing for your sickness, but you go through a doctor, the time of life. And people think, oh, if a doctor comes in, then it's not God. But who? If, if it's a doctor, it's not God. Let me ask you this. How many of you believe God created you? How many of you believe? You sure? You, you truly sure God created you? Truly, truly sure? But look at the process God used to create you. Your father, your mother, met somewhere, did something. A sperm met an egg. That process can be scientifically explained. But the fact that it can be scientifically explained does not take God out of the equation. So let me tell you this. Many times people say a miracle cannot be explained. I say a miracle can be explained. But the explanation does not nullify God. That's why we can, when we talk about God created the heavens and the earth, it's not as if boom, 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 things were happening. There is a process by which the heavens and the earth were created. There is a process by which the earth was created. And that process itself is of God. Because God, in the appointed time, uses the time of life. If God is going to give you promotion in, the, in your office, and he says, this year I, I, would, I will promote you, I will favor you, do you think you would not go for interview? <laughs> did you think that? <laughs> or, or you go to sit at the interview panel, and you cross your legs and say, I don't care what you think. I have a word from the Lord. He will promote me this year. I declare it. You can suck me, but I'll get a job. <laughs> you have your appointed time, but the time of life was aborted. <laughs> so, so, although I believe God is promoting me, I also understand he's using the natural process to bring about my promotion. He's using my job appraisal. He's using my supervisor's appraisal. He's using how well I do my job. He's using how well I've learned the subject. He's using all of that to bring about his purposes in my life. It's called the time of life. 
So as much as we pray for divine appointment, we must also pray that we don't miss the time of our visitation. Because the time of the visitation is going to take you through a natural process that you may not always find convenient. But that's God's process. And many times we look down on God working in our lives because the time of life process doesn't look too spiritual. It doesn't look supernatural enough. We just wish that you were just there. Boom! It happens. You know, and, and sometimes, you know, we hear all kinds of testimonies. And, and, and it's good to hear those testimonies. But it's always good to also read the scriptures. You know, when, when you read the, the story of the account of um, the pattern of the Red Sea, was that a miracle? In the book of Exodus chapter 14? Yes. That's a miracle. That's God opening the Red Sea. But if you read the text, it tells us the process. It says the whole night, a strong east wind blew and opened the sea. Now, if you were there and you were an atheist, you look at it and say, well, this is no miracle. The wind blew. I saw the wind throughout the night. According to the velocity, velocity times time, blah, 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 speed times, you know, ju just do your, and yeah, it will open. Because there is an explanation because God is not a senseless God. He's not a capricious God. He's not an erratic God. He has put into this world natural laws. The laws of physics were established by God. For the running of the system he has created. Scientists do not create the laws of physics or the laws of gravity. They just discover. But the doer is God. They just discovered it. So if you looked at it, there is a natural explanation for the supernatural act. But we don't say, because we can naturally explain something, God is not involved. You can't say because you can naturally explain how a child is conceived, you are not created by God. You cannot say because you can naturally explain the medication you took for your healing, that is not of God. That is of God as well as your birth is of God and supernatural miracles are of God. So the eternal God who can do all things but has created a world where things happen in time and according to established physical laws. When he comes into etern from eternity and works in our time, he respects the systems that he has put in place. Because those systems are of God. If you're cooking food, you have to cook it at a certain temperature. Otherwise, you're going to have sickness. Or you're going to eat something you don't like. Because water boils at a certain temperature. And you have to respect the natural laws of water boiling. You cannot just say in the name of Jesus. I believe at this time. I put this in, in water. Woo, the water boils without any fire. <laughs> That's the Pentecostal of me. We wish that the time of life would be aborted. That all we have is a divine appointment. But God said to Sarah, at this time, I have an appointment with you in the future. But when that appointment comes, according to the time of life, I will return. That means nine months from now, we will come back for the inspection 
of the baby. Because this word of God will work with the natural systems of time and perfect what God promised you years ago. Now for some of you, God is working with you. You don't even know it's God. Because it's natural. It's a natural process. It's people. It's, it's, and, and, you, and you want, so I, I was talking to somebody, he says, Pastor, I want a clean testimony. I said, what's a clean testimony? He said, I want a clean testimony where there is no human being involved. I said, you sure? A clean testimony, there's no human being. You are a human being in the first place. <laughs> so, so you will not be involved and nobody will be involved. Tell me a miracle where there is no human being involved. Tell me a miracle where there's no natural process involved. Even Jesus multiplying bread, he had to start with the material, with bread. And there is a process from his hand to the disciples' hands to the people sitting on the ground. It's a whole process. It's a process. It's called the time of life. So God has already answered your prayer. Most of you are living in the fulfillment of the promise of God. What you prayed for has already started working in your life. But your mind may tell you God has not done it. Or you will downplay the miracle and not give God the glory for it. But the God who rewards our faith is an eternal God. But he works in time. He works with time. He works with his creation. He works with the laws he has put into his universe. And he facilitates all of that to work a miracle. The difference between the atheist and the Christian is we all see the same thing. The atheist sees only the natural. We see the one behind the natural who is making all things happen. They don't give God the credit for it. I give God the credit for it. They say, where well, gravity did it. Where did gravity come from? Did gravity gravitate itself? <laughs> no. Gravity had to be activated. For it to do what it is supposedly doing. So tonight I just want you to know. God is at work. In your life. Yes. He has not abandoned you. He has not forsaken you. Look around you. And you will see all the things he's doing in your life. You will see the people he's bringing into your life. The men he's bringing, the women he's bringing. You see the opportunity he has given to you for you to have a child. But you may probably look at that opportunity and say, I want this kind of miracle. But God has already opened the door for you to have a child. He's already opened the door. And if you understand his working you know that there is no prayer you pray that will go unanswered by God. He answers. And he answers in our time, through his appointed time, and through the time of life. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How many of you sense the presence of God in your life? He's already moving in your life. He's already depositing into your life. He's already turning things around. He's already dispatched angels to bring into alignment every natural event and sequence that is necessary for you to be in the place he wants you to be. Lift up your hands to God and begin to receive from him. Receive the answer to prayer. Receive answer to prayer. Receive the turnaround. 
receive the miracle. Receive. Receive the change. Receive the transformation. Receive the deliverance. Receive joy. Receive peace. Receive children. Receive your husband. Receive your wife. Receive that turn around in your office. Receive that promotion. Receive that money. Receive that financial breakthrough. Receive it. Receive it. He's receive it. He's using all forms of events to bring his purposes to pass in our lives. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you. You are an awesome God. There is none like you. There is none besides you. None can be compared to you. You do all things and you do it beautifully. You are timeless. You are changeless. You are limitless. Nothing can contain you. Even the heavens of the heavens cannot contain you. Creation cannot contain you. You extend beyond all things. But Lord, as majestic as you are, we thank you that you have not abandoned us to chance that you step into our lives. You step into our time. You step into our seasons. You step into the times of life. And you perfect your will in our lives. And so I pray, Father, that you grant everyone here discernment of your appointed time and the time of life. That none will miss their day of visitation and none will miss the working you are working in their lives. We thank you, Lord, for the miracles that have been released. We thank you for favor that has been released. We thank you for turnaround that has been released. We thank you for healings that have been released. We thank you for deliverance that has been released. We give you praise. We celebrate you. And we proclaim, Lord, that it is done in Jesus' name. And everybody shout, Amen. Shout one more time, Amen.